Welcome one and all, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to be with us here to participate in our roundtable discussion. The participants in our roundtable today are from a variety of fields, but you are all um, have one thing in common. You are top leader in the field that uh, touch on our central theme today, the history of artificial intelligence. And uh, let me introduce our driving force behind this event today is Nasli Chokri, the professor of political science at MIT and member of the History of AI Board. Welcome, Nasli. some observation about the um, AIWS project on the history of, of AI. Um, it's a, it's, it's a uh, new project that is a, at an early phase. Um, when I first uh, saw the early drafts, my reaction was, well, this is a timeline. It's just a timeline. On a second look, it began to me that it's a timeline embedded in context. And then it became even more clear when I actually focused on, on uh, uh, the nature of the timeline and uh, going through very carefully. It also provides a first order synthesis of the core contributions that are reflected in those represented in those many, many many pages, many, many pages. And what's interesting is that the volume is large, but there's no shortcuts on sharp definition of what the contribution um, is. So with your permission, I'll take another minute to, to be more specific about um, the features of the design, the organization and the design of, of constructing this historical, this history timeline. So as I mentioned, the first, each contribution is, and is identified by its own context. And as you know, context is very important. Um, and as you go through these pages, you recognize that there is an evolutionary process going on and one that can be very con contentious. At the same time, um, we recognize the works of, of, of remarkable, seminal works of remarkable individuals. And as a uh, social scientist, I'd say that I expect all of us uh, not to recognize all of the entries in that, um, in that history. And I also expect us not to have the same items, same list of individuals that we actually do recognize. Uh, and this, that is uh, one of the important values of the timeline is the way it covers the contributions that all aspects of the scientific community can relate. <clears throat> so this is the, the, the elements from the point of view of, of, of the reader of, of the contribution. I have one, uh, one suggestion, and it may very well be in the design uh, plan, and that is when you really understand you know, what I mean, by not just interactive and so forth, but allowing the reader or the user of the living history uh, to, to, and I had, I had underestimated really the value of, of this, uh, this time frame. And for this reason in particular, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, Professor Mizak's presentation on, on Frank Ramsey. Uh, I had never heard of the gentleman before and I'm truly embarrassed not to have heard. And I'm really mortified uh, to, to realize the extent of, of one's possible ignorance, um, thinking of myself as a somewhat educated person. So with that, I think we'll, we'll turn it over to the, the, the presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nasli. And I totally agree with you that 
looking back at the history is a way to shape and to develop the future. And we should not content ourselves with merely predicting the future with AI as our tool. We can try to innovate and organize it. And to the events of AIW.net, the history of AI, see Frank Ramsey as an AI figure in history who has indirect influence uh, on AI, especially in causal inference. And now we can listen to the author of the first ever biography of Frank Ramsey, a seminal contributor to mathematics, philosophy, uh, and economics, uh, one of the greatest minds of 20th century. Sharon Misak, a university professor and professor of philosophy at the University of Toronto, will talk about her book, Frank Ramsey, A Sheer Excess of Power. Welcome, Sharon. Great, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, as you can see from your screens, uh, uh, this is uh, the cover of my new biography of Frank Ramsey, the great Cambridge mathematician, economist, and philosopher. You will also see his dates there, 1903 to 1929, and it doesn't take much of a mathematician to see that he uh, died very young. He died at the age of 26. And when you hear what he did in those 26 years, um, I think uh, you, if you haven't heard of him already, you will be uh, really quite stunned. Uh, I want to begin by talking a bit about an academic fairy tale, my own academic fairy tale. When I first started to write this book with Ramsey, I had a, a line in the introduction where I said, it's a real shame that no one wrote a biography of Ramsey when there were still people alive who uh, knew him. So some of his friends lived well into the 1980s, and there was a lot of opportunity to write a biography of Ramsey, but no one did. And then I was in uh, the archives at St. John's College, Cambridge, in the Max Newman archives, in uh, one of the code breakers at Bletchley Park. I saw a letter from one Lori Kahn to Max Newman saying, Dear Professor Newman, my name is Lori Kahn. I'm a graduate student at uh, Oxford, and for my thesis, I'm writing a biography of Frank Ramsey. I know you knew him well. I have a motor car. Could I come and interview you? And now, what you're going to hear next is, uh, some, uh, is a sound bite from those tapes that Laurie Khan made in 1982, and I'll have a number of these throughout the presentation. This is Harold Jeffries, the famous statistician and probability theorist who says the following. It's sort of Lee Brown thing, would it, to uh, work for some of some bodies, so that it wasn't very good, so that his paper wasn't very good. And then Bretton Ruffell, uh, after his translation, so that his work was quite great. So don't, don't. Just to wonder what the hell is there to happen, so that. So that's uh, Harold Jeffries uh, saying it, that Ramsey didn't win the Smith Prize, and when they, uh, and when they asked Round uh, about uh, who was consulted, uh, Bertrand Russell said that the paper was absolutely first rate, and uh, they thought it was terrible that this paper at Ramsey didn't win the first prize. That paper had a major impact on the Vienna Circle. The Vienna Circle talked about Ramsey's undergraduate thesis for two weeks in January 1927, and then intermittently right through to 1929. And there you have more Schlick at the top of your screen and Rudolf Karnoff at the bottom, the two people right at the heart of, uh, of the Vienna Circle. So as an undergraduate, Ramsey translated Wittgenstein's incredibly difficult Tractatus Logico Philosophical. And Frege didn't understand him, Moore didn't understand him. And when they were wondering who might translate uh, this very difficult book that Wittgenstein actually wrote during the First World War on the front fighting for the Austrians, uh, they decided that the only sort of to and fro between Wittgenstein, Ramsey, and Russell were Wittgenstein made a few revisions and Wittgenstein declared the translation to be better than the original uh, German that he had produced. Ramsey, uh, actually, let me go back here. Uh, Ramsey uh, then uh, wrote a critical notice of the Tractatus um, and uh, went to meet Wittgenstein for the first time in his little village outside of uh, Vienna, where they went over the Tractatus line by line, and Ramsey realized that 
uh, the material that he had written in critical notice, um, and he had a mathematical account of this deep economic truth as he saw it. Um, and the Labour Party took this so seriously that they uh, were thinking of um, having Douglas as uh, their policymaker. Uh, Douglas's account was called Social Credit. You probably have never heard of that unless you are like New Canadian or Australian. Because after uh, Keynes and Ogden commissioned this piece from the undergraduate Ramsey, Ramsey demolished Douglas's proposals so that they were completely dead in England. And they migrated to the colonies where, when I, where I grew up in Alberta, Canada, there was a social credit party. It was Christian, right-wing, anti-Semitic, and it's just a terrible thing. And Ramsey uh, killed the Douglas proposals in England, but as I say, it moved to the economy. So this is a, he's 17 years old when he does it. Also at the age of 17 and 18, Ramsey wrote another paper in the Cambridge Magazine called Mrs. King <coughs> on Probability. And uh, this is what I think is going to most interest uh, those in AI, Ramsey's work on probability. He was the founder of the subjective account of probability, and really the choice theory, although as you'll see, Ramsey himself would not have liked what happened to his views. So Holmes had written uh, in 1921 a book that made a huge spot uh, in the UK and really all over the world called, called The Treatise on Probability, where he argued for an objective account of probability and that probability was literally a relation between two propositions. And you could observe this here, uh, King Saul. There's an objective, observable relation between two propositions. And Ramsey uh, really tore uh, Kenzie's view to shreds in this paper, but also in a number of papers uh, that he had been given around Kenzie. And Clive Bell, a uh, very good friend of uh, Kenzie, uh, put it this way Ramsey made a rent, a tear in Kenzie's theory of probability, which caused the switches to run. And I'm happy in the QA to answer questions about, uh, about Ramsey and Kenzie on this trip. Also, as an undergraduate, Ramsey wrote a thesis uh, called The Foundations of Mathematics. And in that thesis, he tried to repair a problem in Russell and Whitehead's very famous three volume Principia Mathematica and improve on the theory of types that it contains. And he uh, submitted this paper for the Smith Prize, and it didn't win the Smith Prize. And now, what you're going to hear next is, uh, some, uh, is a sound bite from those tapes that Lori Khan made in 1982, and I'll have a number of these throughout the presentation. This is Harold Jeffries, the famous statistician and probability theorist, who says the following. It's sort of leap round to me that uh, we consulted somebody who said that it wasn't very good, said that his paper wasn't very good. And then back in Russell, uh, after his consultation, he said that his work was quite smooth. So that's uh, Harold Jeffries uh, saying it, it, that Ramsey didn't win the Smith Prize, and when they uh, and when they asked round uh, about uh, who was consulted, uh, Bertrand Russell said that the paper was absolutely first rate, and uh, they thought it was terrible that this paper of Ramsey's didn't win the Smith Prize. That paper had a major impact on the Vienna Circle. The Vienna Circle talked about Ramsey's undergraduate thesis for two weeks in January 1927, and then intermittently right through to 1929. And there you have Moritz Schlick at the top of your screen and Rudolf Karnoff at the bottom, the two people right at the heart of, uh, of the Vienna Circle. So as an undergraduate, Ramsey translated Wittgenstein's incredibly difficult Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Moore had declared it untranslatable. And uh, Wittgenstein famously said that Russell didn't understand him, Frege didn't understand him, Moore didn't understand him. And when they were wondering who might translate uh, this very difficult book that Wittgenstein actually wrote during the First World War on the front fighting for the Austrians, uh, they decided that the only person who could translate it was the 18 year old Frank Ramsey. And Ramsey took the house in the university typing office, 
and he sat next uh, across from Miss Pate, and he read from the German to English, in English to Miss Pate. So he literally translated it on the spot. This incredibly difficult uh, book. If anyone's read it, uh, you, you will know what kind of accomplishment uh, this was. And then there was a lot of to and fro between Wittgenstein, Ramsey, and Russell, where Wittgenstein made a few revisions, and Wittgenstein declared the translation to be better than the original uh, German that he, had, that he had produced. Ramsey, uh, actually, I'm going to go back here. Uh, Ramsey uh, then uh, wrote a critical notice of the Tractatus um, and uh, went to meet Wittgenstein for the first time in his little village outside of uh, Vienna, where they went over the Tractatus line by line, and Ramsey realized that uh, the material that he had written in the critical notice, where he, um, where he uh, made some rents in Wittgenstein's uh, theory as well, uh, still held up, and uh, they became uh, very uh, close intellectual friends for the rest of Ramsey's short life. Uh, ben Ramsey went to Vienna to be psychoanalyzed and spent a huge amount of time uh, with Wittgenstein in 1924. Okay, so uh, he was made a don in mathematics at King's <coughs> College, Cambridge, uh, at the age of 21, which was uh, a record uh, in terms of being junior. And this is what Richard Braithwaite, a very well-known philosopher, and also uh, a friend of Ramsey's, and also a don at King's College at the same time, said, and it's very interesting because it was clearly Keynes that managed to uh, get Ramsey uh, in as a fellow of King's College instead of Trinity, where Ramsey was an undergraduate. So here's great work. Because then, of course, Keynes stepped him up before he got in at Trinity. Oh, sorry. You know the expression? Pounced. Pounced. Keynes pounced. Oh, Keynes got Keynes. Keynes to pounce. I didn't realize Keynes' ability to get the college to agree to pouncing. So King's College, Cambridge, pounced on Ramsey and hired him as a fellow at the age of 21. He became a superstar in four disciplines at the very least. One is pure mathematics, second is economics, the third is subjective probability and expected utility theory, which one I think will interest this audience uh, the most, and uh, the fourth is philosophy. And I will go through uh, some of his major accomplishments uh, today. In pure mathematics, he has a theory of combinatoric mathematics named after him, and that is Ramsey theory. Uh, it's a theory of the conditions under which order must occur. <clears throat> and this was literally an aside of Ramsey's. He was writing a paper in the philosophy of mathematics. He had to prove something, so he stepped aside. He wrote eight pages. He uh, proved something that's called Ramsey's theorem. Uh, that, uh, that feeds into Ramsey's theory, and that was a profound truth of mathematics, uh, and now he's uh, very famous in mathematics for Ramsey theory, and if you go to any good department of mathematics in the world, you'll find one or two Ramsey theorists. In economics, he published two papers, both were in Keynes's journal, the Economic Journal, and uh, one was titled The Mathematical Theory of Savings, of saving. It was about uh, how much a nation or a society should save for the future. And in that paper, Ramsey uh, founded uh, the discipline of optimal saving theory. And he argued, and this is actually something that is very pressing today, he argued that one mustn't discount the utility of future generations. So if you think of the environment, for instance, uh, we think that we should save some of the environment for future generations, but we of course don't know whether those future generations might exist. Uh, for instance, a pandemic might wipe out uh, the population of human beings. And on classical utility theory, that would suggest that we discount the value of future generations and use up more of the environment uh, for ourselves. And Ramsey, in this paper, and as its title suggests, it was a mathematical theory of saving, uh, was really the first very, very technical mathematical paper in economics. And uh, Ramsey argued in this paper that actually it would be unjust to discount the well-being of future generations. 
So despite the fact that fossil utility theory suggests that we should discount uh, the well-being of future generations, Ramsey said it would be an injustice and we must not. And this is something that uh, really was a feature of all of his work. He combined extreme uh, technical ability with a sense of justice. The second uh, paper is called A Contribution to the Theory of Taxation, and it founded the subdiscipline in economics of optimal taxation theory, and uh, it is still taught in every graduate course in economics in the Western world. In 2015, when the Journal of Economics celebrated its 125th anniversary with a special edition, both of Ramsey's papers were included. So there were 13 papers in, a, in 100, 125 years of this journal, one of the best economic journals in the world. The 13 greatest texts of this journal, two of them were Ramsey's. And the editors had to explain the unusual step of including two papers by one author. Because as you can imagine, there were a lot of very good economists who wanted their own papers in that uh, anniversary volume. And the editor said, look, these papers each initiated entirely new fields and they both have to be included. And economics Ramsey was also very much a side discipline. So these wonderful letters where Keynes is trying to persuade him to write these papers. And Ramsey says, Okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this paper, but uh, it's really distracting me from the foundational problems of philosophy, and that is what really gives me at the moment. And uh, um, he eventually dropped economics and went back to philosophy. Okay, Sherry, thank you for your. Um, um, actually, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna finish with one more slide, and then uh, okay. we'll have Q and A. So the the third. Uh, an area that Ramsey's famous for, as I said, is subjective probability expected utility theory. And uh, this was a paper they wrote in 1926, a few years before Ifanetti, the Italian. Ramsey figured out how to measure partial belief. He put forward a theory of probability of subjective degree of belief, and he showed that rationality could be understood as expected utility. He gave this paper, it was called Truth and Probability, in a, in a discussion group in the Moral Sciences Club. Keynes was certainly in the audience because Keynes was writing about it afterwards. And Keynes took this as the real reputation of his objective account of probability because now Ramsey had not only poked holes in Keynes' objective probability, but he had delivered a way to measure partial belief by looking at belief as habits of action. OK, I'll pause there and take questions if there are any. OK, thank you. And Right now, about subjective <coughs> uh, probability, we will have a question. But first, I'd like to say congratulations on your marvelous book. And uh, you know that uh, you have a lot of great comments uh, from reader uh, and uh, um, comment that your book is an excellent, beautifully written book about foundation figure foundational figure uh, in modern economic thought and philosophy. Congratulations, Sherry. Thank you. Yeah, and, um, and in this uh, historical event, I would like to say a quote. AI can't be truly intelligent until it has a rich understanding of cause and effect. This is a quote from Judea Kern, a computer scientist and statistician at UCNA. He is a giant in the field of colon inference, and he wrote the book of why, which illustrates how it's necessarily to create AI that understands probability. And unfortunately, Zidia can't be with us today, but he prepared a question for you, Professor Misak. So I will read his question to you, Sherry. Is that okay? Yes. In the history of AI, Ramsey is remembered as the one who, re uh, who resisted the Keynes' logical approach to probability theory and argued that the risk of belief should be viewed and studied as subjective entities. Specifically, that the risk of belief should be measured not through introspection, but by considering them as basis of action in wedding settings. In these were revolutionary ideas at the time, uh, Professor Julia Kern wondering what reaction they evoked with the scientific 
leader of the tribe? Please, Cherry. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so as, as I uh, said a minute ago, this paper of Ramsey's Truth and Probability was read to a philosophy reading group in Cambridge in 1926. And then he was going to take that paper and turn it into a book uh, titled Truth and Probability. And he really saw this as his major achievement. So 1927, 1928, 1929, Ramsey wrote three drafts of the first part of this book. And then January 1930, he died. So the, the world didn't actually see um, Ramsey's full account of probability because he died before he could, uh, he could produce it in full. And he never published the paper Truth and Probability in his lifetime because he was going to do more with it in this book. So after Ramsey died in 1930, a volume of his papers was posthumously published. And uh, Truth and Probability was in that volume. It appeared in 1931. And Bruno Di Finetti uh, in 1932, 33, started to put forward the same ideas. And a lot of people have thought, hmm, surely Di Finetti must have picked this up from Ramsey. And then afterwards, uh, von Morgenstern and, and, uh, Morgenstern and von Neumann, again, reproduced Ramsey's results. And people again thought, I, they must have known about this. And so this is one of the great mysteries of uh, probability theory and national choice theory. How much did Di Finetti, uh, Morgenstern, von Neumann know about Ramsey? Uh, people suggest, and I actually suggest in the biography, that uh, the great economist Piero Sraffa, who knew Di Finetti, uh, may have uh, told Di Finetti about Ramsey's results. And Morgenstern was very much uh, in the periphery of the Vienna Circle, who, as I've said, was reading Ramsey and was very, very keen on Ramsey. And so it may be that Morgenstern, uh, via the Vienna Circle, also read uh, that 1931 uh, published publication of Truth and Probability. So that it's a very long answer to Jane's question. At the time, people didn't. Uh, didn't acknowledge Ramsey as being the founder of subjective probability uh, theory and rational choice theory, but but in from the 1950s on, people started to say, look, all of this was in Ramsey, and actually it was it was in some ways better in Ramsey, and so now he is very much understood as the founder of uh, subjective probability theory and rational choice theory. But at the time, because he died so young. Uh, people didn't see him as having been the first to get this result. Oh, thank you, Sharon. And uh, also, there is a story in your book uh, from Ramsey's uh, school day concerning his uh, principal opposition to the brutal system of bullying and hazing at his uh, boarding school. You remember? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, um, I, uh, I was so impressed that Ramsey even made a bargain with his uh, younger boy assigned to him that he would not be required to do any chores at all for him. Uh, in return, the boy was paid forward to his assigned junior. So interesting. So we see the young Ramsey uh, was a man of principle. Um, yes. Shirin, uh, so what Ramsey attitude do you think are relevant <coughs> to his scientific work? Yes, yeah, so Ramsey had a very, very strong sense of justice, even as a small child. And he clearly got this from his mother, who was a campaigner for women's rights and for the rights and uh, protection of the working class. So he was sent to Winchester College when he was very young because he was very clever. And because he was a, a, a large child and a large man, uh, people didn't really see that he was three, four years younger than everyone else. He was terribly bullied at Winchester, and he hated bullying, not just, and he, he wasn't terribly bullied. He was bullied in the kind of standard way that British public school children were bullied, but he hated bullying. And when it was his turn to be a prefect, and so that he could order around his own slave, his own junior, and get him to polish his boots and to wash up his, his breakfast and his tea, 
Ramsey made a, as Lauren said, Ramsey made a bargain with uh, this young boy. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. You don't have to do a thing to me. I'm not going to bully you. I just ask that you do the same thing when you're a prefect for your junior. And one wonders whether uh, that uh, that was paid forward. I, I somehow doubt it. Um, but Ramsey's sense of justice uh, was there right from the beginning, and uh, he wrote some very important things uh, in economics, in philosophy about uh, about justice. Okay, and I may have uh, one comment that this attitude of Ramsey is so relevant today because we don't have the same level of bullying and hazing at school, but we have bullying online. Right, and if you want to build AI for better world, we need more effective policing of cyberspace, and we need more people with principle justice, like Ramsey, I think. And actually, I invite you to speak uh, the second part of your presentation, please. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so um, it just says that these results of Ramsey's play a prominent role in contemporary economics, Bayesian statistics, as well as much of. Uh, psychology, artificial intelligence, and so on. Um, Ramsey would not have liked what became of his ideas in economics. And this uh, this it will start to link into the recent questions on justice. But Ramsey thought that no real person can have a set of beliefs that are perfectly coherent in terms of the probability calculus. He said that he was talking about in this proof that all partial belief can be measured and, uh, and rationality is consistent. See, in terms of the probability calculus, he says, look, I was talking about a highly idealized system to which those of actual people, especially the speaker, especially me, Frank Ramsey, myself, only in part approximate. So a, a theory of rationality that has rationality being uh, formal or consistent with uh, with the probability calculus is too idealized the human the human requires. Ramsey called the uh, highly idealized theory fairy tale and he wanted something more realistic, more a human logic rather than a formal logic. He was a socialist, just like his friend Morris Dobb up there in the property screen and uh Carol Trappa. Both of these were Actually, they were much more social than Ramsey. They were famous Marxist economists, whereas Ramsey was more, more uh, kind of guild social. But Ramsey thought that you know these were these were the economists that uh, were more on the page, uh, the same page that he was. Now let's turn to philosophy. Quickly, uh, I know this is not a uh, an audience uh, of philosophy, so I'll go through quite quickly. Many things are named after Ramsey and philosophy. Ramsey sentences, the Ramsey quest for conditionals, and on and on and on. My favorite, though, is from Dr. Davidson, uh, one of the very best philosophers of uh, the last generation. And uh, Davidson named the Ramsey effect. And the Ramsey effect is discovering that your exciting and apparently original philosophical discovery has been already presented and presented much more elegantly by Frank Ramsey when he was 26 years old. So Donald Davidson himself uh, felt, felt the Ramsey effect very, uh, very sharply. Ramsey uh, was one of the very few people in philosophy or in any, uh, in any domain who could counter Wittgenstein, who could argue against Wittgenstein. So first, we are going to, I think, to Ramsey's uh, widow, uh, Lettuce. Uh, if it's not lettuce, it's going to send Francis Parker. Because whenever he says that somebody was wrong, it's a song. And therefore he'd say it. And that's why he'd stand, I would say, he'd stand up to God himself. That, wasn't, that obviously wasn't Francis' <laughs> widow. That was Wittgenstein's nephew, Thomas Sondro. So that Ramsey. Uh, when he thought that something was wrong, he would just say it. He would stand up to God himself, i.e., he would stand up to my uncle, Ludwig. So let's hear that again. Because whenever he says that somebody was wrong, it was wrong. And therefore he'd say it. And that's why he'd stand, I would say, he'd stand up to God himself. Okay, here's another soundbite, and I'll tell you who it is after I hear it. 
Frank made him cry sometimes. He, he you know, thinks himself a person who would go on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> I think Frank is very trying. I mean, he, he, he certainly he was the person who would wear you down. <laughs> so that is Frank Ramsey's widow, Lettuce Ramsey, saying that Frank Ramsey used to get into philosophical wrangles with Wittgenstein in 1929, and Frank used to make him cry sometimes. Yeah. He, Ramsey had a profound influence on Wittgenstein, persuading him to drop the quest for certainty and purity and turn to ordinary language and human practices. Frank Ramsey was in search of a realistic philosophy, and he was leaning in the direction of American pragmatism when he died. And this is Ramsey in 1929. He's giving his accounts of how philosophy should proceed. We cannot really picture the world as disconnected selves. The selves we know are in the world. What we can't do, we can't do, and it's no good trying. Philosophy comes and not understanding the logic of our language. But the logic of our language is not what Wittgenstein thought. The pictures we make to ourselves are not pictures of facts. So this is Ramsey saying we need a human logic, we don't need the pure logic Wittgenstein put forward in the Tractata, where we picture the world as disconnected self. All this, and he died at the age of 26, and I think I, I found out, with the help of two very good medical professionals, how he died. He died from leptospirosis or bile disease caused by bacteria carried by urine of animals and often found in the river cam, and Ramsey loved to swim in the river camp. Now let's look at some of his friends, a little bit more of his life. Um, uh, and uh, see what they uh, said uh, when he died. This is Lytton Strachey up in the top of your screen, uh, writing to J.D. Wylands. Uh, they're both uh, very famous figures in the Bloomsbury Circle. Strachey writes, The loss to your generation is agonizing to think of, and the world will never know what has happened, what a light has gone out. I always thought there was something of Newton about him the ease and majesty of the thought, the gentleness of the temperament. Now, you might ask, how can any one person who is not Ramsey himself actually write an intellectual biography of Ramsey? And that's why he had to wait 100 years uh, for his intellectual biography. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I dealt with this problem. I mean, no one, no one is able to, uh, to know about all of this technical material. If they're not random inside. So I dealt with this problem by having guest boxes. Uh, so, you know, bound uh, boxes where the, the top people in the world, the top experts in the world, have uh, have said to the, have written to the specialist what is so special about Ramsey. So I have Sir Parker Gasupta on Ramsey's economics. Gasupta is uh, uh, one of the finest economists in the world. And he is the former uh, Frank Ramsey Professor of Economics at the University of Cambridge. I have Hugh Price, Simon Blackburn, and many other philosophers writing on Ramsey's philosophy. And then I have the greatest uh, Ramsey theorist uh, in the world, uh, Ronald Graham, writing on Ramsey theory. And uh, uh, perhaps there are some mathematicians in the audience. Um, and uh, you can, uh, if you like, uh, try to claim your $1,000 because in his guest box, uh, Ronald Graham writes the following. In fact, the author has made the rash offer of $1,000 to anyone who can improve, who can prove or disprove the following. So if your mathematical abilities are up to that, uh, prove that little uh, problem in, in Ramsey theory that is as yet uh, unproven and you can claim your prize. So this is how I, how I cope with uh, the, the huge amount of technical material, although I explain that technical material for the non-specialist in my text, and uh, the non-specialist can read my text and then just skip the guest boxes if, uh, if they're so inclined, and I suspect that a lot of people are skipping the guest boxes, but of course, uh, you know, the, the Ramsey theorist in Common Talk Mathematics is going to be hugely interested in Graham's guest box. Ramsey also had an excellent and interesting personal life. 
This is Francis Partridge, uh, right at the heart of the Bloomsbury Circle, and uh, you get to hear the wonderful uh, Bloomsbury accent. We need some things. Enjoyed simple things. He had a tremendous sense of humor. I used to have an enormous laugh. His whole mouth, his whole face cracked when he laughed. He was too And this is his widow, Lettuce uh, Cotley Ramsey. Uh, she became a renowned portrait photographer and adventurer, and this is what she has to say about uh, about uh, about Ramsey again in 1982. He said he was very good at using his great brain to pick out the essential, well, what was important in any situation. I'm not talking now about maths or philosophy or anything, but in an ordinary situation. I mean, he would be very good at picking out what, in any human situation, what was the thing that was important. He came up to Cambridge a year after the Great War. He was part of the English migration to Vienna for psychoanalysis in the early 1920s. He was psychoanalyzed by one of Freud's students. And he was part of the Bloomsbury and Apostles uh, groups. Uh, here are some of his friends. Up there is uh, Kinsey Martin, and there's uh, Ramsey uh, in the corner with Kinsey and Irene Martin. Uh, Martin is uh, the future editor of the New Statesman. Uh, there he is on the same holiday with Paul Redmayne, uh, part of the Cadbury family. His family was very impressive. Uh, there you have uh, the whole lot, except for Michael at the top. And this is Michael Ramsey. Uh, Michael Ramsey became the Archbishop of Canterbury, and uh, he was Ramsey's younger brother, and Frank Ramsey was an atheist, and of course Michael Ramsey was not an atheist, and they used to have uh, very, uh, very mm -hmm. good-humored wrangles about whether God existed, and uh, Frank thought that Michael was, uh, was completely wrong-headed in, uh, in thinking that God existed. Uh, they had a, an open marriage, Frank and Lettuce Ramsey, because they were part of Bloomsbury. And this was Ramsey's other great love, Elizabeth Denby, who was a very influential housing reformer for the poor. Again, Ramsey was only interested in people who had a sense of justice. Uh, here are some of his other friends. Uh, Tui Zemo, a very famous uh, Chinese poet. Pat Blackett, Nobel uh, Prize winning physicist. And uh, Lionel Penrose, the father of uh, UK English genetics. Ah. So one of the first times I met him at Cambridge was when uh, they were giving a party. I remember we uh, they were mixing some curious skin with uh, a pure alcohol. So that is uh, that is uh, Lionel Penrose. Um, uh, Penrose's brother uh, talking about the famous parties the Ramses used to give where they uh, where they fed you uh, drinks mixed with pure alcohol. Again, he's part of Bloomsbury. That's Virginia Woolf, who knew him, uh, and uh, other figures uh, from Bloomsbury Circle. And finally, I'm going to end, uh, and I'm going to let Ramsey uh, get the last word. This is from an untitled paper he read to the Apostles in 1925. I should say I'm going to give the last words to Ramsey. Um, and these are very uh, profound and moving words um, that uh, shed light on what he thought about the meaning of life. Yeah. It was a response to Wittgenstein, who had scorned the Apostles as having nothing to discuss, and who thought that everything outside the primary language of logic and direct experience was unsayable or ineffable. It was also about the meaning of life, which Wittgenstein said, you can't talk about. And Wittgenstein thought, not only can you not talk about the meaning of life, but it's really depressing. It's also a response to Russell, who said, you can talk about it, and it's really depressing. So here's Russell. Russell says, all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system. The whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. So this is Russell saying, you know, you can talk about the meaning of life, but 
it's really depressing because we're all going to be buried in the debris of the universe in rooms, and that means that what we do is absolutely feel meaningless. And here's Ramsey. Mm. Where I seem to differ from some of my friends, i.e. Dickie Stone and Russell, is in, in attaching little importance to physical size. I don't feel the need of humble to feel the vastness of the heavens. The stars may be large, but they cannot hope their love. And these are qualities which impress me far more than I does. I take no credit for wearing nearly 17 stones. My picture of the world is drawn in perspective, and not like a model to scale. The foreground is occupied by human beings, and the stars are all as small as Stephanie gets. I apply my perspective not merely to space, but also to time. In time, the world will come and everything will die. But that is a long time off still, and its present value at compound discount is almost nothing. Nor is the present cost valuable because the future will be blank. Humanity, which still work around as my picture, I find interested and on the whole admirable. I find, if now at least, the world a present and exciting place. You may find it depressing. I am sorry for you and you despise me. But I have reason and you have none. I pity you with reason because it is pleasanter to be thrilled and to be depressed and not many pleasanter, but better for all one's activity. His argument is that those philosophers who focus on the vastness and the unknowability of the world are on the wrong track about the meaning of life. What we're interested in is the world of human beings and making things better for them. We can discuss or affect our feelings about the meaning of life and about any kind of effort in just this sense in terms of the impact on human life and behavior. One reason why he was so pleased with his life in 1925 is that he was solving problems in highly theoretical matters, but also about how much nations should save for the future, whether we should discount future generations, how we should think about progressive politics and ways of life. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Sherry. <clears throat> Thank you, Sherry. And I was so impressed by um, uh, Ramsey quote about meaning of life. What are what we are interested in um, in the world, in being and making things better for them. Uh, a mind uh, like uh, the mind of Ramsey uh, to this. help us. And with that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Sherry, Ms. Ak. And I'd like. To, I'd like you to uh, give her a, a virtual applause. Can you do it? Please, virtual applause for Baru. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful, and I'd like to emphasize that it is the first time such full biography has been written about Frank Ramsey, the exceptional British mind of the last century. And, uh, I have some questions for you, uh, Sherry. Um, how did you find such a colorful story to grip with uh, attention uh, 90 years after his death? How did I, how did I come to uh, write this article? How did you find uh, such kind of colorful stories to just tell uh, us? Um, you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I've written a book um, on on philosophy, on, <clears throat> on truth and belief, and, and uh, Ramsey was the philosophical hero <clears throat> of that book. And I had had to do some work in the archives to find out what his theory really was, because there's a lot of unpublished um, material still. And uh, I was in Cambridge for a year. Uh, I was a Disney fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge, and I was having lunch with Martha Sen, and I was talking with Martha Sen, who is the um, Nobel Prize winning economist, and I think our, our greatest economist. 
and uh, and Ken was a student of Pierre Serafin and Serafin uh, uh, Wittenstein and obviously New Ramsey and uh, Amartya who had this biography. He said, "Look, you know, it's got to be done, uh, and you know, you should you should just do it." And so I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine writing a posthumous biography is a very, very hard and very laborious process. At any point during the process, do you feel like... Uh, it, 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 it took a lot. Mm -hmm. um, is there any point... It, uh, it did take a long time, but it was, it was a huge... Mm -hmm, I see. I heard that I, uh, you spent 10 years in writing this book, right? 10 years. Yes, yes. So it took a long time, and, and I had I went to archives in Cambridge and Oxford and Amsterdam. The archives are scattered all over the world. It's in, 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 in New York at Cornell University, um, and uh, but it was a huge amount of fun. Uh, it was, it, you know, it's for an uh, an academic, uh, you know, writing on on these things is just is a huge amount of fun. Hmm. I am uh, I am curious about uh, at any point during this process did you feel like giving up? No, not once. Really? Wow. And what was your not uh, once, not for a minute. <laughs> so, what was your motivation to write this book? Your motivation. Can you hear me? Well, my motivation was that this was a thinker with an really unbelievable reputation in philosophy, in economics, in mathematics, mm -hmm. in probability theory. But people in mathematics, for instance, didn't know that he was uh, such an influential philosopher. People in economics didn't know that he had a branch of pure mathematics named after him. So I, you know, really, it really needed to be done. So Marcus Sen was right; uh, uh, it, it needed to be done. When he first said you should write a biography of Ramsey, I said no. <laughs> I laughed. I said it's impossible. And he said, it, you know, it's a hundred years. Uh, we've been waiting a hundred years for it. It needs to be done. And uh, you know, who's going to do it if you don't do it? And I said to him, well, you could do it. But uh, you know, Marcus Sen is not a young man, and uh, he said, uh, "No, I think you should do it." And so that was my, my motivation. It needed to be done, and uh, it, I think the best angle into a thinker this complex is either some philosopher or a certain kind of philosophical-minded uh, economist like Marcus Sen. Mm. And uh, if you could get back to this time, and you could meet Ramsey. So uh, you could interview him directly. What would you ask him? Is that clear? I, I, I you completely cut out. I didn't hear anything. Okay. <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, and I have uh, one another question. Why it is relevant to publish this book now in twenty twenty? <coughs> So these ideas are always relevant. You know, Ram, the, Ramsey's uh, work in philosophy, and economics, and mathematics, which I think is being discussed everywhere all the time in uh, you know graduate courses. You know, if you Google work in Frank, you know, papers about Frank Ramsey, it's a huge, huge uh, number of them. But um, I think uh, one of the one of the reasons that uh, it's worth um, writing a blog for Ramsey now. And of course, I you know I didn't have this in mind when I started a decade ago. Is that we really need economists and philosophers who aren't pure, who don't think, for instance, that a mathematical model is uh, is the whole story of our economy or the whole story of our relationship to the world. And uh, Ramsey was one of the most technically gifted, brilliant uh, philosophers and economists ever. The full stop, ever. Technically brilliant. 
And, uh, and yet he saw that formal systems don't get us uh, what we need. And this is something that, uh, you know, that I think AI is realizing now as well, that you can have uh, uh, the best formal system of artificial intelligence, but it needs to uh, be fed by human values. And without human values, you just have a machine that could, well, you know, that is on the value list or has the wrong values. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, and now I'd like to invite our uh, discussion. Um, on our discussion panel today, uh, we also have uh, Barry Nolan, six-time Emmy Award winner. Hi, Barry. And Barry, could you please share your opinion? And uh, I have one question to you. What would Ramsey tell us to do now during COVID-19? And, and should we listen to him? Please. One of the things Ramsey seems to have, my uh, capacity for mathematics sort of ends at being able to uh, calculate the square, the area of a circle. So uh, a lot of this I am unable to follow. But he seems to have recognized the enormous utility mm -hmm. in capturing the irrationality mm -hmm. built into human behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, the, the reason people embrace Keynesian e economics over, say, the Austrian right-wing economics or Marxist left-wing economics is the model of human behavior seems to be more predictive of how things work and what will be successful. So in AI, for instance, in the algorithms we are using to do things like predict the future uh, mortality of the pandemic, is it, will it be helpful to embrace some of Ramsey's recognition of the pig-headed, <laughs> irrational way people <laughs> tend to act even when acting that way may get them killed? <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, so I, so I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, R Ramsey uh, saw that human irrationality couldn't be, uh, couldn't be, um, sort of mathematically worked out of the system or left out of the system. You know, human irrationality is something that we have to take seriously because it's not going to go away. So we should always be trying to become more rational. Mm -hmm. But to if we ignore human irrationality, we ignore it at our peril. And you know, we're we're seeing that uh, now, right? We have um, you know we have a highly irrational, if that's if that is, is uh, it's no, there's no strong enough word. We have a highly irrational president of the United States right now. And, you know, we can That's see the havoc that that is uh, wrecking. But to set up our models so that they only deal with purely uh, ration, rational uh, agents, it's a disaster. Hmm. Okay. But, and yeah, Jimmy, I follow up with a, one of the things he looked at was how we calculate present mm -hmm. value over future value. And one of the examples we see of people discounting, uh, making irrational calculations about future value is getting back to work sooner will get you more money. But mm -hmm. the future utility of money uh, approaches zero <coughs> if you're dead. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, yes. that's right. And yes. uh, I have one question, I, I don't know. If Sharon or Barry uh, could answer us. How might 20th century uh, thoughts have been different if Ramsey has survived and his idea has caught on earlier? Or is this a very difficult question? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry that he died so early well, because it seems so, like his uh, so personality. I think in, just mm. in economics and AI. Right? Mm. Yeah. So, so a lot of a lot of people in in mathematics say, oh, you know, he would have, uh, you know, he would have with Turing, um, you know, uh, uh, fi you know, figured out how to do computing, and he probably would have actually. It was one of the greatest near misses in mathematics. Alan Turing came up to King's College just after Ramsey died, and Ramsey would have been his supervisor. Um, instead, it was Max Newman. Uh, but anyway, there are a lot of what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. But one thing that we can, I think, definitely say 
is that Ramsey, because he's considered the founder of highly mathematical economics, mm. uh, and he because he was so technically sophisticated, he would have been saying to the subsequent generations of economists who got completely uh, obsessed with and taken in by the mathematical models, mm -hmm. he would have been able to say the, the kinds of things that Gary has been saying. No, we need to account for human irrationality. No, we need to think about uh, future generations and, and we mustn't discount uh, them. So I think the, the course of mathematical economics might have been completely different had their very, very best uh, mathematical e economist, Frank mm -hmm. Ramsey, been mm -hmm. on the scene to pull them back from the purity of their models uh, and from the idea that the that those models corresponded to reality. Hmm. And um, what achievement of Ramsey uh, should the <clears throat> history of AI consider as the biggest historical one? You know that today uh, we open uh, the the forum, the online forum, the history of AI, and what achievement of Ramsey should the history of AI consider as the biggest historical one? Maybe Mr. Tuan Nguyen uh, like to ask yeah. the question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think I think it's pretty clear that it would be the fact that Ramsey came up with a subjective account of probability, which then laid the groundwork for uh, Bayesian statistics and Bayesian probability. Oh. So, you know, that's just, you know, that's gotta be his greatest um, contribution to artificial intelligence. Oh. All, all of Bayesian reasoning uh, comes from Ramsey's figuring out how to uh, think of probability as subjective degrees of belief. Mm, thank you. And Barry, um, if you could um, uh, could uh, get back to this time and you could meet Ramsey, I wonder uh, what question uh, would you ask him? You know, one of the reasons I think the, the world had such a loss when he died so early was that one of the professor's characteristics that she brings out in the book was that he was enormously likable. I mean, here's a guy that's talking about the most complicated ideas in, in, known to mankind, and he, but he talks about it uh, when he talks about the meaning of life and mm. how it's better to be happy than to be depressed. Mm. He's a very likable human. And people mm. tend to listen to people they perceive as likable, as, you know, somebody like me. Uh, mm -hmm. Than no. somebody that seems like a you know a grouchy old uh, grizzled professor. No offense to all the professors in the world. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that that uh, Ramsey recognized that the irrational human emotion mm. uh, is something that we need to <laughs> no. take into account. The, the emotion of just liking somebody. Yes, we are more likely to listen to their ideas. Mm. So one of the things that AI should take into account mm. is the e emotion people feel when presented with ideas. If mm. it's an idea that seems uh, lecturing or condemnatory, mm. you know, they're not going to listen to uh, rules about how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 as mm. well as if you speak to them in a way that feels like, you know, their friends, the, the the their friend's mother, that they really like the best of all the people yeah. in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Barry, uh, for your recommendation, and also uh, I'd like uh, to know whether any others uh, participate. Yes, I think that's completely right. And Ramsey also he had this lovely turn of phrase, and he wrote, yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, you well, know, first, would you explain what Ramsey's sentences are? I just looked that up, and it's, it's great. <laughs> Do you have an hour and a half? <laughs> oh, really? Well, basically, uh, it's saying something really complex in a way that you substitute uh, mathematical ideas or complex uh, philosophical things with everyday things, like. Uh, if a man is on a really long journey, the comfort of his shoes is going to be far more important to him 
than the eventual heat death of the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's uh, one way of thinking about Ramsey's sentences. So Ramsey, in this Ramsey sentence lies uh, within a problem for science and the philosophy of science. So how do we think of theoretical terms that are unobservable um, in science? Uh, and Ramsey said that the best way to think about them is to think about a, a, a like a story. You say, once upon a time, there was a girl and that girl, and then you tell a story about that girl. And you don't have to, you commit yourself for the sake of the story to thinking that the girl exists, but you, you don't have to metaphysically commit yourself to thinking that the girl exists. So with very, very abstract scientific entities, um, where we're not sure if they exist or not, you can still think of them as real because you tell a story in which they figure. Um, and that that uh, story or that Ramsey sentence is a very long technical sentence. Um, and uh, that's how it usually gets used. But, yeah. Thank you. And uh, now I'd like to um, invite uh, Professor Kirill. Kirill, uh, do you have a uh, question to sharing? Yes. Yeah, but can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Very clearly. First of, all, first of all, thank you for your talk and uh, thank you for your book. So I spent <laughs> present hours reading it. And actually, my question is about Ramsey. Ramsey was a broad-minded person and uh, even spent some time uh, in psychoanalysis. So probably this is uh, this study of uh, deeper layers or consciousness influenced uh, some his mathematical works so and speaking about uh, the development of strong artificial intelligence in your opinion will a breakthrough in this area occur from side of abstract mathematics yes. or from side of cognitive sciences and philosophy where is the greater potential today Yeah, so, so Ramsey thought that uh, the way you assess a belief or a scientific theory is in terms of whether it works or not. And uh, he went off to Vienna to be psychoanalyzed because he was paralyzed about sex. Uh, but also, it was, it was very much a thing in the 1920s. Everyone was off to Vienna to be psychoanalyzed. And... Uh, and uh, it's pretty clear why Ramsey was paralyzed about sex. You know, he, he went to Winchester when he was three years younger than all the other, than the youngest boy. And then he graduated at the end of the First World War. And he went to Cambridge with all the returning veterans who were now six, seven, eight years older than he was. And again, he was a, he was a big guy and he was very, very clever. So people didn't kind of understand that he was so young and so immature. So he was absolutely paralyzed with respect to sex. He goes off to be psychoanalyzed and he's cured very quickly. So Ramsey always thought, well, you know, uh, th uh, there's got to be something to psychoanalysis, even though a lot of it sounds crazy, because it works. And, uh, and he thought this idea, as you say, that there uh, might be a subconscious uh, was, a, was a very respectable scientific theory again, because it seemed to work. And, uh, and so he, you know, he, um, this, this does have implications for uh, AI in the way that, uh, that you suggested. Um, and, and Ramsey certainly, you know, had a lot of time for psychoanalytic theory mm -hmm. and the subconscious. Mm. What, about, what about today? <clears throat> How much we can get from uh, cognitive sciences uh, for building uh, artificial intelligence? Mm. In Europe, yeah. So, I, yeah, that's that's a. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, you you probably would say much more sensible things about it than I than I would. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, maybe somebody have um, a more question. Thank you, Kirin, for your question and a very interesting answer and another interesting story from Sharon Isaac. And uh, Kirin Kiprin, the professor of, uh, director of Pop-Up Institute, will now introduce uh, their new AIWS Leadership Master Program. 
And I would like to ask uh, Kirin Kiprin. Uh, Mr. Kirin, could you please tell us uh, what is the difference between the AIWS leadership program and the normal leadership master program? Why does AI society require special leadership skill and knowledge? <laughs> <coughs> Okay, uh, you, you, you just mute your voice, please unmute. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So my opinion uh, is like, uh, if we only shape technology, mm -hmm. we cannot put it, uh, cannot put it uh, to the society. So uh, people is like a world, is like a system. So it's like uh, an airplane. Uh, there is no part which is flying, right? But when we put it together, we can get the flying thing, right? So also I, I see in this area the same principle. So if we put together our like philosophical leadership thinking and technical stuff, we can uh, build some, uh, some good future for us. If we will tune only like separate areas it would be like a mess like a set of technologies set of knowledge without any system mm -hmm. okay and now uh, it's time you introduce your AIWS leadership master program uh, can i share my screen of course because, because now because now uh cheryl is uh, I'll, I'll get out of this yeah Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, just enough. Just a moment. So. I will share entire screen. Mm -hmm. Please. Well, just a moment. Mm -hmm. Technical guy, <laughs> technical guy, <laughs> technical professor. <coughs> yes, yes, this is like always. <clears throat> yeah. No, I can share why. <laughs> One more attempt. Okay. I'd like to comment that uh, AIWS Leadership Master Program is uh, really newly developed as uh, a core um, uh, program and it is a cooperation between. Um, Can you uh, see it? Uh, yes. Saint, okay. Saint, Saint Petersburg uh, Institute, uh, Pop Pop Institute, and uh, AI World Society. Okay, please, Kirin. So, okay, I will be quick. So, I like to introduce to you uh, AI Society Leadership Master Program. This is new program which is built uh, together between uh, Electrotechnical University in Saint Petersburg and uh, Popov Institute. Uh, I will talk a bit uh, about this uh, institute later and uh, AIWS. So this program uh, is motivated by like obvious things. So artificial intelligence uh, rapidly changes the world uh, in all areas. So, and as I said, answering your question, so only technology solutions, uh, we, we, we cannot shape only technology solutions, only technology. So all technologies should be seamlessly integrated uh, into the society and we have to think like uh, about a, about this system uh, like uh, artificial intelligence driven society so and actually for doing this we have to uh, grow up leaders uh, and people who can innovative uh, thinking and uh, this is actually like a main challenge in the uh, nowadays so uh, this uh, program 
has uh, two tracks. It's technology track and uh, where we uh, study artificial intelligence fundamentals like mathematics, uh, some introduction, introduction into artificial uh, neural networks, machine learning, deep learning and stuff like this. And uh, also in this track we have uh, like a set of uh, subjects on uh, applications of artificial intelligence in order to uh, be able to put uh, like fundamental knowledge to the industry, to the society. So there are like uh, regular uh, AI stuff with, which we can find in uh, many universities in the world. But uh, main uh, thing here is leadership and innovation track. So here we have like uh, subjects which is required for leaders. It's management, it's finance and marketing and leadership itself. So, uh, and uh, to build this program very strong, we are going to provide for students uh, one year project uh, under guidance of uh, the big leaders. So in this uh, area we have uh, faculty which includes people from uh, Artificial Intelligence World Society Innovation Network. So there are some of them uh, on the pictures. So it's uh, people who are working together, probably you know many of them. So, and also for, uh, especially for technological track, we have uh, people from uh, Electrotechnical University. So, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, to conclude in my talk about this uh, master program, I would say a couple of words about uh, Alexander Popov International Innovation Institute for Artificial Intelligence, Cybersecurity and Communications. So, as you know, uh, Popov worked in uh, LIT many years ago and he was a pioneer uh, and created radio. Uh, by the way, everybody knows that uh, uh, communications and radio yeah. was a change in technology, right? And now we uh, want to reinvent, like, to be pioneers in artificial intelligence uh, uh, world. Wow. Mm. I would say I would say it's enough from uh, my side. If you have questions, I I, I will be happy to answer. Mm -hmm. Maybe you will have questions later online. And thank you very much for your introduction, um, uh, Professor Kirin uh, Klinkin. And I also hope that uh, you will have a lecture about uh, Ramsey, Frank Ramsey, the exceptional mind. Uh, uh, of uh, last century, okay? Sure. Okay, you promised. Thank yes, you. Yes, I promise. We will invite Cheryl to give this lecture, right? Okay. Yes. She's, have you been uh, Saint Petersburg? Yeah. Okay, and uh, now it's time uh, of conclusion, and I'd like to invite uh, um, Nazli Chukri. Professor of MIT, a member of uh, AIWS.net, uh, will make a conclusion. Nasli. Well, I have to say, if you, first of all, this was a remarkable presentation. Please tell me again, you can hear me. Wonderful. Yes? Okay, Very clearly. <laughs> I'm amazed at the way in which the oh, Author Carol was able <clears throat> was able to extract from a variety a variety of very very different sources uh, and different resources the, the fundamental features of an individual who was so uh, multi dimensional in his own research and in, in his own view of life and an individual was able to contribute very clearly. Uh, and communicate across disciplinary dimensions, something that is very difficult to do. And this is an individual who has innovated as well and recognized as an, as an innovator. In terms of, 
uh, addressing some of the issues that was of Cheryl, uh, my own sense would be that had he been, had he had a longer life, or had he been alive today, I, I really do see him as a major bridge builder. Uh, because as you know, I'll speak for the social sciences, but I'll also speak for technology fields. Um, there's a tendency, has been a tendency to develop knowledge as silos, you know, vertical, a vertical field of information that don't connect to associated, related, possibly fields. Um, this is the way we built knowledge, and this is the way we were proud of building knowledge. Uh, we also know that there's a major effort on uh, underway in the last 10, 15 years to moderate the silos and to develop cross-disciplinary uh, efforts. But it's very hard for a scholar, a young scholar, to get recognition in that process. Uh, those that provide the recognition are siloed, field-specific. So what stuns me about, uh, I'm amazed at this, this, uh, this, this uh, person uh, that had the genius or the ingenuity or the insight, I don't know what the right word would be, um, uh, to not only understand connectivity, but to uh, contribute to connectivity and to dealing and to deal with the field whose basic assumptions are really quite different from each other. So if he had been alive today, let's assume he was a contemporary at, at, at the moment, I, I would see him as the major the framing the leader that would frame an integrated strategy for knowledge. I don't mean homogenizing. I mean developing not only the incentives, but the anchors of having people in the different fields understand the benefits, the advantages, uh, the contributions that can be done by taking some of some of those silos some of those silos down um, what really among the things that impressed me about Cheryl's um, presentation professor Misak's presentation uh, is the interaction intersect combination of the, the human being and uh, yeah. his contributions but also the human being interacting with his uh, contemporary contemporaries, uh, not necessarily in, in age, but in profession, those alive and well, um, even if they were they were very much uh, older. Uh, mm. The, the uh, one other thing that impressed me, and I'd like a verification from Cheryl on this, is that it seems to be a scientist, a researcher, a scholar. Um, that had no self-doubt about his scholarship or his research. He may have had personal self-doubt, um, but the, 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 uh, the willingness and the ability to push back and to argue uh, is a very, very important, it's something we don't learn. Either we have it in us or we don't have it in us. And my sense from what I heard today and what I read in preparation was that uh, shyness at a professional level, intellectual level, was not his problem. Mm. Um, yes, so that's right. He was very confident in he put his... Funny, I would say that I regret very having lived all those years myself without the, knowing about his work. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. 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 But he does... See, there are letters from Ramsey uh, right through other times where he says, Oh, you know, I'm no good, or this piece of work is no good. So he did have some self doubt. Um, he was I can't hear Cheryl. Can you put her on? Mm -hmm. um, and I have here one uh, comment from Mr. Sung Yen. Mr. Mr. Sung Yen uh, would like to quote, uh, would like to repeat the quote from uh, Martin Luther King. Cheryl, can you repeat what you said? Um, so I said that he 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 did have some. I can't hear it. I, I, uh, yeah, I I think you're not. I think there's some problem with the connection. Um, okay. Oh, you can email me and I'll give you the pamphlet. Okay, I can't. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I'll, I'll by email. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, Nazli, uh, will you continue? <laughs> thank you. Nazli, thank you to and thank the organizers. Thank you, thank you Nazli. And thank you for the update on where we're going next. Uh, okay, and I'd like to... On the, the program, the new program. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a while to have all this, uh, to absorb it easily. It's been quite an amount. Um, of insight, of knowledge, and the best way of spending two hours that I can think of. So thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Nazli. And uh, here, um, Mr. Sung Nguyen have a comment, right? Uh, Sung Nguyen, uh, would you like to speak out? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for uh... Uh, for setting it up and uh, i believe that I, I agree with nasli this is a wonderful two hours uh, especially to learn uh, about uh, um you know one of the uh, uh famous uh, uh scientists uh, mathematics uh, but i think the work he has done in that uh, 20 some years 26 years um it's not about uh, mathematics, but it's about the interdisciplines, uh, the practice uh, that we have. Um, so I, I would, uh, I would like to get the book to read and and uh, and to understand more. Uh, but but I, I will be more interested in uh, 1925. Uh, I believe that's the time that that he has a breakthrough to change, you know, in in his his life. And what happened in that 1925? Uh, that's something that I I am really interested in, um, and also the formula that uh, Cheryl you post um, the function W of n. Mm. Uh, uh, it's very interesting because that part of the the knowledge management uh, strategy uh, that now today that people are using. Uh, so 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 that should be very interesting. Uh, you know, cross function learning uh, from, from that formula in, into the knowledge management that people do. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. And thank you so much. You just um, made a comment that uh, no matter how long you live, but uh, how you live, it's a Martin Luther King course. Thank you. And now, um, Mr. Nguyen Nguyen, director of Michael Luther King Institute, member of the History of AI Board, uh, please, um, can you share your opinion, like a conclusion? A wonderful talk, wonderful event. Thank you so much, Luan. And uh, also thank you all, because uh, I think this is a historical day of the uh, history of AI with uh, this talk. And uh, this talk will come to AIWS House. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Terry Nisak, uh, for your fantastic talk and historical talk of the history of AI today. Yes, now one. And also, thank Professor Judah Pern. He is an uh, advice. Okay, well, thank you. Organize. He mm. recommends to organize the Zip Talk. He took with me open. This is a great book and also great event, a mm. great uh, speaker for AI, even he indirect for AI. But his theory is very high impact influence for AI for future. And uh, he recommends to organize it up and I connect with uh, Cherry and now we have a great event. Thank you so much. I thank again with Professor Judah Pern. He's why have emergency health issue. So he cannot directly be involved and he send a uh, question uh, discuss with Cherry. But this talk that from Judah Pern. Thank you again, Julia Fern. Yeah, thank you so much. And Luan now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you all. And uh, um, today, uh, AI is a field of those uh, future is <clears throat> not of such like uh, everyone in this uh, virtual room, as well as the life of our children, grandchildren, and a future generation to come. And today we celebrate, you know, what was day today? Uh, today is really a historical day, and today is a very special day. It is uh, the day 
the birthday of Buddha in Vietnam, in many countries around the world, we celebrating the birthday of Buddha. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, um, the, the core philosophy of Buddhism is based on cousin and parents. And today we also celebrate the history of AI. And it is uh, also the history of dreams to, in the computer is cousin reasoning. And as you know, Ramsey have um, had uh, influence to cousin influence by his impressive uh, accomplishment. And uh, by doing so, Ramsey is acquired the modest pioneer has possibly unwittingly contributed in preparing the way forward to others to follow. Uh, uh, everybody knows that it is not easy to be a pioneer. It requires uh, not just knowledge, but vision and courage. And it takes com a community uh, to make AI being developed and deployed in a way that benefits all mankind. And thanks to the support and input of experts, experts like yourself, the development of uh, the development history of AI will continue into the future for a better world. Thank you, Sheremi Sak, for sharing your Frank Ramsey with us. Thanks to WSR, thanks AIWS House, thank you for all organizer and participant. Bye bye. 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 See you in the next event. We have continued series event of AIWS House and the history of AI. We have series special events. See you later. <laughs>